are in Judges chapter 6. And we started a three-part series last week, and we're talking about getting involved and finding our place in what God has given us to do. And we're looking at the life of Gideon. And so we're getting down to Judges 6 and verse 25. And it says, That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, Behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar is the one that's been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubbabel. That is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. I was looking at this passage this morning. And I was thinking about times that I have become a part of something I didn't really want to be a part of. Y'all ever had that happen to you? You kind of got involved in something and you think, why in the world did I let myself get drugged into this? And I thought in particular one time I was on a committee for something and I really wasn't, it wasn't really something that interested me at all, but the person that had asked me to be on the committee was somebody I just loved, just really liked them and, and wanted to help them. And so I said yes without thinking about it. And as soon as I said yes, I had thought about it, and I thought, what did I just say? Me and my big mouth. Y'all ever had these kind of experiences? And so we would have these committee meetings, and I would sit there, and I know I was supposed to be there giving suggestions how we could make things better, but all I could think is, I wonder what I need to do to get off of this committee. You ever had that happen? And, and, and so here I was. And, and the problem was this. What they were doing was something that was important. And it was something that was needed. And it was something that, that needed to go ahead, but I wasn't committed to what was going on. And as we're talking about getting involved in doing things for God... We want, we want people to volunteer. Matter of fact, outside after service this morning, we're going to have tables that are in the hallway out here, and they are going to be representing different ministries of our church that we're needing help in. And so you can see exactly what's going on, where we're needing help, where we're needing volunteers, where we're needing people to step in and, and, and come beside us. And so you can, you can learn more about that. We need that. And it's important that we have that, but we don't want just people showing up and and being like, well, here I am. You made me do this. You pushed me. Instead, we want to think that you're committed to doing something for God. And now I realize there are some things here that, that we need done that are big things that you need to have kind of a call, but there's other things that we need here that, that aren't always like some big call. It's just we're needing some help. And, and sometimes, you know, I can tell you, there's been a, in my ministry, I have set up a lot of chairs and tables. I have had, I, I get a great workout regularly here at the church, setting up chairs and tables for different things. And here we got some people who get them set up a lot of times before I ever get to it. And it, it's a blessing but I, gotta, I doubt anybody ever heard the word of the Lord come to them saying, thus saith the Lord, I, I, I call thee to set up chairs and tables for my kingdom, right? 
It's just something that's needed. But you know, regardless of what you may be doing, whether it's something big or something that's just kind of people don't see, but it's necessary, I want to think that you feel committed to what you're doing, that it is, it is something that's important to you. The Bible, Paul talks about the fact that, that we together represent the body of Christ. And then he goes through all this talk about all the different parts of the body. You think of all the different parts of our body and how all of them are important and how they should all work together and, and, and they're all vital. And, and it's important that every part of our body works, right? Everything. And, and there's nothing that we can say, oh, that part's really insignificant. It's not, well, it's not insignificant when you're needing it. Or if it's hurting, it's amazing how something very small on you, if it's hurting, can cause a lot of pain. And so everything, everyone is important. And we all need to work together to do what God is giving us to do. And that's why we got into the story of Gideon. You remember last week, Gideon was, was in hiding, and he was called by God to lead the nation of Israel against the Midianites who had been terrorizing them, taking everything from them for seven years, and it was, it was just miserable for Israel. And so God calls Gideon, who makes clear he doesn't want to do it. And, and he makes all kinds of excuses that why he doesn't want to do it, and, and, and he finally kind of comes around. And we talked about that, and we said it's important that when God is leading us and, and pushing us into something, that we don't make a bunch of excuses that keep us from doing what God wants us to do. But now we come to the next part of this. Gideon is committed, or is agreed to do it, but he's got to be truly committed to what God is calling him to do. And we see that he's on the right path because the verses right after what we looked at last week he brings to this angel a meal, gives him something to eat, and he worships him, and he gives this, worships God, and he builds an altar to the Lord. And that may just be something we, we kind of read over, but, but I like that part. Because I've seen times that people have a sense of being called and led by God, and instead of it being about God, it becomes all about them. You ever seen that? You know, God's laying on somebody's heart, I've got this thing for you, I want you to do, and all of a sudden, hey, YouTube, I want you to know what God's got for me. He's called me to do amazing things. He sees my gifts and he sees my talents, so just be watching and to see me in front of thousands of people. Or there could be the TikTok version of that. Yo, TikTok, right? <laughs> I don't know what else they do on TikTok. That's all. I've only seen a few, but all of them are the same. And, and so here we are, and, and we begin to promote ourselves. Gideon could have gone and just, I want to announce to the nation, I am your leader. But instead, he builds an altar to God. What is that saying? It's saying the beginning of, of working and following God is realizing that it's not about us. And see, a lot of times that's what's getting in the way of us truly serving God because we're making it about us and it's not about God. I remember one time I was at another church and, and this guy came, he moved to town and, and he, he had really kind of important, significant job that's kind of a big deal. And, and he came to me and said, I just want you to know whatever you're needing in this church, you, you let me know, I'll help in that area. I want to just serve, I want to be involved. And so it just so happened that we had a big need. We needed somebody to kind of coordinate all of our like ushers and greeters and all these people and welcoming people. It's, it's, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of organization. It's a lot of work. And so I said, well, you know what? I actually, I actually have something. And, and I told him about it, and he got really upset because he felt he was too prestigious and important with his big job to have been doing something, he saw somehow one of the most important things we have in the church was kind of below him. And see, so often we get to this place that we think, well, this is below me. I'm, I've got all these other things. And so this is, this is why we have God tell Gideon that he has a job for him to do. And it's got to start with Gideon. He's made this altar to God. It's not about him. But he's got to be fully committed. God didn't just call Gideon to lead the nation. 
he called Gideon to be right with him. And so Gideon starts right. He's, he's built this altar. But there's something more that God wants him to do. There's, there's, there's a, a job that's necessary. And what this job is, is that God wants him to tear something down. It says, that night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that's beside it. And so what's going on? Gideon's to lead the nation. But you know, before God takes us to anything big, we got to start small. There's things that's, that's got to that's gotta begin to grow in us. There's, there's things, you know, you watch the Bible often compares us to, to you know, growing and, and maturing and becoming fruitful. No one ever plants a seed and gets produce overnight. There's, there's got to be a growth process. And, and this is what we often miss. People say, well, I can't see me ever doing anything like that. It's too big or I get too nervous or I, blah, blah, blah. I get all these things. And, and what we're missing is God will grow us into what he has for us if we will allow him to grow us. And so what has Gideon got to do before he starts leading the nation? He's got to start by cleaning his own house, taking care of things at home, something that, that needed to be dealt with. Because Israel was in the mess they were in because they had been worshiping false gods. They had, been, they had turned their back on God and they began to, to follow after all these other gods and God said, well, fine. If you're going to have those other gods represent you, then I'll just back off. There's, there's no way I'm going to be in competition with all these gods that you've built all these altars to and all these things. Well, it, they're finally, the nation finally, if you remember last week, they, they come around and they go, we can't, this is, everything's falling apart. Everything's terrible. We need God. We need his answer. And, and, and so God is raising up Gideon to free the nation, and to bring the nation back to God. But in Gideon's own hometown, his dad has built an altar in the center of town to the god, the pagan god, Baal, who's this god of rain and thunder and storm. And so that's there. And then there is a pole to a fertility goddess who was considered to be the mother of Baal, the goddess Asherah. And so these two things represented the allegiance of the city, of this village. And they were there representing where the hearts of the people were. And God says, if you're going to lead, if I'm going to lead you in bringing freedom to this nation, I need you not to have this at your front door. I need you to get this garbage down. I need you to tear this thing up. And see, the beginning of commitment is realizing it's not about what people are going to see from me, but it is where my heart is with God. Have I fully surrendered my life to Jesus Christ? It doesn't mean am I perfect and never make a mistake. It doesn't mean that I never get frustrated with my spouse or upset with my kids or, or, or say something that I regret or think something that I don't want to be thinking. Those things are part of our humanity and we want to grow and we want to show Jesus more in it, but we're all human. And so God doesn't say, you've got to be perfect, but we need to know that our heart needs to fully be given to God. And so there are times that we have allowed things to become a part of our life that we've got to tear down because we are fully committed to what Christ is calling us to. And this is something that I think that, that we're going to have to just grasp in these modern times because we've got people that are having a hard time telling where Jesus wants us to be and where we want to be in the world, and they're trying to stand in the middle. There's no standing in the middle anymore. We're at a time, I believe God's calling the church right now to say, are you here for me? Is what you're doing about me? Are you following me with all your heart? And he wants the people who are serving him and doing things to him to be fully committed to loving and following him with all of their hearts. So we've got to take down our altars. And what would those altars look like? Well, certainly anything that's sinful, 
in our life. We, you know, there, there's no way you can be following after sin and following after God. You're going to be one or the other. Jesus talked about people who were greedy and love money, and Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. It's, it's impossible to, to be fully committed to both of those things. You're going to have to pick God or money, Jesus says. And, and so we've got to do that with anything that's out in the world. And so a lot of times this altar we've got to tear down are those sinful things we're doing in our life. A lot of times the thing we've got to tear down is doubt in our life. You know, there are people, it's, it's a natural thing that we will sometimes question the things that are around us. Some of us, some, some of y'all, y'all go for anything. And, and I hope you know, there's people online waiting for you. And, and it is, this is a good time to get wise before this goes any further, because the scams out there are getting scary level. And so we gotta, we got to watch out. But, but, you know, we all struggle with, what do I believe? What do I trust? What's important to me? And, and there is a struggle that a lot of us may have sometimes. And do we really believe and trust in God. Is, is he really there? Is he really important? And, and it is a natural thing to think. I meet some people who say, I just don't believe in God. And, and somehow, as I talk to them, or in a way that they're saying it, I, I pick up this vibe that they have made this decision. They are the only person who's come to this realization and this question, and they're somehow smarter than everybody else because they know to question God. Well, you know, we've got, we've got a word for that, or a term for that, and it's called worldly thinking. And, and what they're saying is, is I'm thinking with the mind of the world, and I have closed my eyes to the mind of the Holy Spirit. And I somehow think I'm smarter than anybody else that's serving God. Now, I can tell you, if you're wrapped in that much arrogance, the devil's got you. And, and you're going to have to realize that, that to ever really know and follow God, you're going to have to discover the truth of Hebrews 11.5. Without faith, or 11.6, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, do you hear those words? You must believe that he exists. You know what that tells me? People today think they're more sophisticated, more modern. They're thinking these things nobody's ever thought before. But ha ha, 2,000 years ago, people were struggling with that same thing. Matter of fact, the Bible even tells us in the book of Psalms, another 1,000 or 2,000 years before that, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so this is, this is an old deception of the enemy that has been around forever and ever. And they, there's people that the enemy will always use, and, and he'll try to get them puffed up and try to get them thinking, oh, you're, you're, you're seeing things. You're, it's because you are a genius. You, you, you're too smart for Mensa to be thinking like that. And you know what? All that's happened is you've got, you've got a pagan altar in your life, and, and you, have, you have created something that to stay there, you have had to blind yourself to the truth of God. And I want to challenge you, if you're battling with that, hey, I've, I've struggled with that. There's a lot of people in here that struggle with that. But God is real. God still changes life. God's still building his church. God's still in control of history. God still can change a life when it is brought to him. And I just want to challenge you to begin to change your thinking because often what's happened is people have got to this place that they just, they're like, well, you know, I, I could see all these things and, and all this stuff, these church people, it's all just coincidence. Is it really coincidence? You have been able to decide that things that can't be explained otherwise is just a coincidence. Once again, is that not arrogance? Is that not arrogance that you can decide that? And so we have to begin to realize maybe I'm not letting myself see God at work because I've decided everything's natural. Once again, this, this is a, an altar to man thinking and we're, we're not allowing ourselves to worship at the altar of God. There's so many other kinds of altars we can build. Sometimes we just have bad priorities. 
I've met, I've met people before that have this order of bad priority, and, and they're going, I just, you know, I'd like to help at the church, but it's just, I, I, I can't, I just, it's just too hard to be there that early. Well, what time were you thinking you had to be there? Because we're only needing you here at 10, a half hour before service. Well, it's just so, well, and then if they would tell the truth, what, what they're saying is, you know, I'm on my computer till 2 or 3 in the morning, and I'm surfing or I'm playing video games or I'm doing this. See, there's nothing wrong with playing video games or well, some video games, but there's nothing wrong with video games or, or surfing online as far as there's nothing bad that you're going to. That's, that's good and wonderful. But when you're using that as an excuse to, to do nothing for God, your commitment is not to the things of God. And see, these are the altars that we've got to start tearing down. We need to say, are there excuses that I have allowed to come into my life? There's things that I have prioritized wherever we're putting our time, wherever we're putting our finances, wherever we're putting all of our thoughts. That is what our altar is. And if we're never thinking about God until it's time for church, and our, most of our thinking before that is, I don't even know if I want to go to church today. Well, guess what? We've got false altars. There's things that we have put in front of it that have become more important. And it is time to tear those things down. And so here goes Gideon. And I love this. It says in verse 27 there at the beginning, it says, So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. Now here's what's funny about that. If you were here last week, you will remember one of the excuses of Gideon was this. I can't do what you're asking me to, God, because my family is so poor. We've got nothing. We are the poorest tribe in Israel, and we are the poorest family in that tribe. We are completely without resources. And now here, a few verses later, Gideon took 10 men of his servants. What? This poor guy... And, and, and the way this is said indicates that there were more than 10 servants that he had. And see, this is the way these excuses work. We always can come up with these excuses why we can't do something and why we've got all these things. And let me just say this, if you're not doing anything for God, if you're not letting people know that you serve God and that you follow him and, and letting them know and inviting people you need, know that need church and inviting them to church and people you know that are hurting and praying for them, and if, if you're doing none of that, excuses have overtaken you. I love you and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're watching live stream. But excuses are destroying our commitment to Christ, and we are committed to the wrong things. So they go, and they tear down this altar. But this isn't just a tear-down project. There's something else that Gideon is told to do, and we, we see it here as we get into verse 26. It says, and tear down the, the, the old things, and build an altar to the Lord your God, on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order, then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So what was Gideon supposed to do? Tear down the old and build something new to God. And this is, maybe we just read over this and we may miss this, but you know, this is, this is actually a very vital spiritual principle. This is something that, that, that is important to get and something that, that we miss. We, we get that we've got to tear down the old and, and get away from that sinful lifestyle. We, often we've got evidence to show that that, that that altar we were following before has led us to really bad places and got us in a lot of trouble. So we get that God wants us free of that. But what we miss is that, that once God does that, there is, a, there is a vacuum that is in our life. And there is, there is, there's got to be something of a spiritual nature that's inside of us. And, and, and what, what those false things are, they're, they're just a bunch of junk food that we've crammed into ourselves trying to, tr trying to fill that hole. But that, that was never meant to be filled by those things. Those, those things were deceptions that led us on a wrong path the right thing is we've got to get 
the Spirit of God to fill us in a way that we can feel his leading, find our joy and peace in those things, and discover his power for our life. So the old's got to go, but the new's got to come. And there's actually, I, I, I don't want to get into talking about demons today, but, but there's actually Jesus is talking about someone that, that has been delivered from a demon, and he talks about the demon leaving this person, and this person never really anchoring into anything of God, and how this, this thing will come back if we leave ourselves empty. And so we see it in Luke eleven twenty four 24 through 26, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to the house or the person from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order, then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. Now, I know this. I know some of y'all would love me to go into explaining this more. We'll get there someday. But the principle is what I want us to get. God, God will clean our house. What we, what we couldn't do, God can do in our lives. But we, we've got to give a commitment and allegiance to God as he does these things in our life. You know, I get tired. I, as a pastor, I've done this a lot of years, and I see people that are in big trouble, and they need God. They want God. They know they, they, their, their life's falling apart, and everything's being destroyed, and there's, there's got to be this answer. And, and, and so they come to church, and they get saved, and they get baptized, and they're going to do all this stuff, and, and God meets them. And, and starts to turn their life around. He brings them freedom. He brings, but they never, they, they love what God's doing, but they're never fully committed to the things of God. And so what ends up happening, God gets them over the hump, and then they're gone, right back to where they were. What happens? The things that they had, they, they got away from, they came to God, but they weren't fully committed committed they didn't build the altar and this is what we've got to see is that God is calling us to create an altar in our life to him get rid of the false altar and build the new altar and what does it mean what does it mean when we have an altar what was the purpose of an altar in the old testament it was meant to be the place that people would approach God it was meant to be the place that they would bring their sacrifices. It was meant to be the place where they would come to be made right. It was the place that they would come and express their joy and their gratitude to God. It's a time that they would come and they would express their sorrow and, and would, would repent. And it was a time when they were hurting that they could come and they could find answers. And, and so this, this is what we're talking about this morning is we have got to be people of God's altar. God's altar, not the world's altar that leads us into all this garbage, but the altar of God that brings us into the presence of God because our God told us in the book of Hebrews, if, if any of us are struggling, we can come to his throne boldly. I mean, we all have an altar in our heart that brings us into the throne of God where we can find his peace, his solution, his way, but it will require a whole commitment to him. And so we tear down the old, we build the new, and we realize what? We realize that God has changed who we were. And this is what is spoken of in 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. What's it saying? It's just saying, you know, you can have nice bowls and dishes, but you may use them for things that aren't so great. I don't know. You think fill in. You know, I, I, one time I, I, I saw a picture. I, I think I've told you all this before. I was at somebody's house, and they showed me a picture. And You know, I, I just want to pre-say I love dogs. I love your dog. Your dog, your dog's a good one. I don't even know your dog, but I love your dog. I'm just saying this out before so nobody gets mad at me. Y'all got what I'm saying? 
But if I come to your house and we have a snack together, I don't want to eat off the same plate as your dog. That, that dog, your dog deserves a meal. He deserves to be taken care of, and I salute you for the love you show. But even if it's gone through the dishwasher, I'm just not so sure. It, it's hard for me to forget that. And so it's just, I, it, and just forgive me if you don't see it that way. But, you know, to me, that's a plate that's been given to the dog. And I've seen dogs eat things over the years. And I know what some of you all are saying. Dogs don't have as many germs in their mouth as your kitchen counter. Keep believing that. <laughs> Keep believing that. I'm not buying that, but I've heard that for years too. But I, I, I'm not sure what science that came out of. I think it's something they circulated through dogs or us. But I, I, you know, I, just, I just want something that's set aside and apart for human use. And, and what this verse is saying is God takes us no matter how messed up we were. No matter what we were, God takes us and cleans us and sets us aside for noble purposes. Noble purposes. You have been created to make a difference and you have been cleaned and set apart and made holy by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God use us. Or we don't want to be. Some people, they have these nice dishes that never get used except just to sit there and get dusty. But God wants to use us as royal vessels to make a difference in this world. So we tear down the old. We, we embrace the, the new. We recognize we've changed. And then we do something that we are committed to doing to make a difference for God's kingdom and the people he's trying to reach. I'll finish this up. I like the part, this last little part of this. He, Gideon does what he did, but if you look, there's, you know, this thing called foreshadowing. There's something that you sense, you know, sometimes you're watching a TV show and something's happening and, and it looks like it's resolved, but you look and you know there's still an hour and a half left of this movie. That's a foreshadowing. That problem ain't been solved, Right? And, and we get a, a foreshadowing here in, at the end of verse 27. It says, but because, if somebody tore down the altar, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Mm hmm A little foreshadowing that there is trouble coming. He's doing what God wants him to do, but he's afraid because he knows the people in his town are not going to be happy about this thing. And so sure enough, he, he, they do it. The next morning, they get up. Who did this thing? What was this person? And after they searched and inquired, they, did, they figure out that Gideon did it. And then the men of the town, they come out and they say to his dad, bring out your son. We are here to kill him. We got a, we got a problem on our hands, right? Here is the man God has ordained to bring freedom to the nation, but he's not going to make it out of town because his town's going to kill him. This is a problem. And it's a struggle, and it's a reminder to us that sometimes God may be calling us to do things that people just don't understand. And I'm not talking about anything weird, but they may not understand why you're volunteering time. They may not understand why you're getting involved in certain ministries, why you're a part of this or that. And, and, and they may make things a little rough, and, and there are times this happens. And, and here, you know, this is, this is something, Gideon's done something, we think, oh, false altar. But in these people's mind, these are farmers. <clears throat> and they have, they have set up this altar to Baal because he's a rain god. And they figured that that's the way that when it's not raining, they could go to Baal and he would keep the rain coming so their crops would grow. That's a shearer pole. Is, is if, you, if your wife wasn't having children, you need children to help take care of the farm. And so you go to the Asherah pole, and, and this is going to help you. And a lot of times there's kind of lewd things that's happening around here. So, so there's, there's kind of a pleasure thing going on, and there's a spiritual thing going on. And so this becomes, it's right in the center of town, and, and this is a big deal to them. And suddenly, suddenly Gideon says, this is garbage. It's got to go. We're doing something real for God. And their worldly thinkers, they don't understand. There will be people who will not understand what we do for God. Then we say, well, you know, I, took, I asked some of the neighbors what they would think if we did this, and they don't. Well, you know what? So what? 
What does God say about us doing this? What's, what's the Lord's direction? What's God's thing on this? And, and sure enough, as we begin to look, we discover this. If God calls us to do it, we're going to do it. And I love how this, this comes out, that Gideon's dad ends up standing up and saying, just these words of wisdom. And what were the words of wisdom? Well, you guys think Baal's mad and you need to kill Gideon because of it? Well, if Baal's really mad, why don't you let Baal kill Gideon? Why are, you, why are you guys all worried about it? Looks like Baal's got the problem. Go ahead and just, just allow Baal to contend for himself. And sure enough, we know Baal doesn't seem to be mad because Baal's just a piece of stone that they've given this myth to, that they've revolved their life around. And Gideon, even though they didn't understand this, but Gideon was doing the best thing that could happen in that town. He was bringing him freedom, but it took his dad standing up for him. And it reminds me that when we're serving God, we're not doing it alone. God's got people who stand beside us. And we will not be abandoned, but God will stand with us and he will help us through because we've got one another. We always love that scripture out of Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron. And, and, and we need each other. We, we sharpen each other up as we do God's work. And God has those people. And so my prayer for us is this. One, that, that we're fully committed to God, that we really are serious about this, that, that we find our place that God has for us and that we give ourselves to that and we discover the joy that, that belongs to that. And that three, that we realize why Christian community is so important as we stand together and we discover the joy that belongs to us. Will you bow your heads with me across the building? And as you're, as you're doing that, I just want to ask right now, where are you with God? Have you, I, I'm not even getting in, we're going to have the, 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 the volunteer fair out there, there's plenty of tables to look at, but before we even go to that, you know, this has got to start by us making a commitment to Christ, by us acknowledging if we have not given our lives to Jesus yet, that we got to acknowledge him and we have got to begin to turn from those things. And we call that salvation. We call getting, that our, our, getting our lives right so we can live the life that Jesus has for us. And so this morning, is there anybody who just lift their hand and say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with God. But today, I want to start living for him. I want to, I want to turn away from the life that I've been living, this worldly life, this false altar that I've been, that my life has been built around. And I want to, I want to become the person that Christ has, has called me and made me to be. Is there anybody who lift their hand and say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be, but today I want to start living for Jesus. Amen. God knows our hearts. Those of you watching on live stream, you can, you can lift your hand wherever you are there. We're going to say a prayer right now. And as we say this prayer, we want to, we want to just... We just want to, to pour out our hearts and say, God, I want to make things right with you. So if you lifted your hand today, even if you didn't, we're all going to pray this together. But if you'll pray with us and mean this, this will be the start of you being a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I've made mistakes. I've done things wrong. I've bowed at the wrong altars. Today, I want that to change. I want to start living for you and following you. Thank you for forgiving me and for this new start. In your name, Jesus, amen.